is the full board meeting of Manhattan Community Board 5. I'm Vicki Barbero, the chair. And as usual, I'll just go through very quickly how we proceed with uh, starting off by hearing from any of the elected representatives, the electeds who are here, um, followed by any representatives who speak for two minutes each. We then go into our public session, which is the opportunity for anyone from the public to bring information to the board. If you wish to speak, please sign up by 6.30 and be sure to include the subject you'll be addressing as well as your contact information. And remember there's a time limit of two minutes. Uh, we then go into the business session of the board, which is uh, the adoption of the minutes, the chair's report, committee reports, resolutions, and question and comment period, and then we vote. So comments and questions from either applicants or the public, or if additional information is needed or allowed only with the chair's approval. So we will start uh, this evening. Uh, do we have any of our elected here joining us this evening? Um, please raise your hand if you are here. If not, we will go right to the representatives. And if anyone comes in between, we will hear them at that time. Okay, so let's start with the elected reps. Please raise your hand. We have Justin Flagg from Liz Kruger's office. Hi, Justin. Hello. Um, so yes, I'm Justin Flagg from Liz Kruger's office. A um, couple of quick things. We're right in the middle of uh, budget hearing season in Albany. As the chair of the Senate Finance Committee, Senator Kruger runs a total of 13 hearings over 11 days on all aspects of the budget. We've had nine so far. We have four more to go next week. If you wanna watch any part of the hearings or read any of the written testimony that people have submitted, you can go to nysenate.gov click on the link for budget hearings, then click on public hearings. I'll put the link in the chat. So you can just click on the public hearings tab. You can see the ones that have already happened. You can see the live stream of the ones uh, to come next week. And if you wanna read more about the governor's uh, executive budget proposal, I'll put another link in the chat for the division of budget website that has all that information as well. Um, after the budget hearings are over, the next step in the process is for each house of the legislature to pass their own response to the governor's proposal called the one house budget sometime in early March. And then the final budget uh, has to be voted on by April 1st. Uh, last week, Senator Kruger introduced a new bill, the Gas Transition and Affordable Energy Act. This would remove um, statutory requirements and ratepayer subsidies that drive the expansion of the state's gas distribution system and require the Public Service Commission to develop a statewide gas service transition plan to ensure equity, reliability, and affordability in the process of decommissioning the gas system to meet our climate mandates. Um, given New York City's ban on gas hookups in 2024, the governor's proposed ban in 2027, this kind of a process is critical to ensuring that low and moderate income rate payers are not shut out of the benefits of renewable options and forced to bear a larger and larger share of the cost of obsolete gas infrastructure. So I'll put that uh, link for that into the chat as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you, right on the dot. Thank you, Justin. Yep. Next up will be Franklin Richards. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, just a, a few updates from Councilmember Powers. Um, following a resolution passed by Community Board 5, Councilmember Powers joined with other elected officials to urge the Landmark Planning Commission to designate the Roosevelt Hotel as a landmark. As a council member expressed, the Roosevelt is an iconic property in the history of New York City. Next, at the end of the last calendar year, 2021, uh, Councilmember Powers wrote a letter to the mayor's office, Mayor Adams' incoming team, to address the sanitation issues in Koreatown, and that was joined by Congresswoman Maloney. Uh, this week, DSNY and the Clean Up Corps conducted a swarm and intensive uh, resource allocation event in the Koreatown area. They flooded the area with clean operation, including street sweeping, uh, cleaning graffitis, and will monitor the area and advocate for additional services as needed. 
Over the past few weeks, our office has hosted three COVID-19 test giveaway events. We distributed essential supplies to our community, including at-home COVID-19 tests, uh, K95 masks, hand sanitizers, and a face shield. All three events were hugely successful. Uh, we distributed over 500 tests to residents across the district. It was great to see so many neighbors come out and get resources. They need to protect themselves, and we advocate that everyone stay safe, get tested. Uh, and finally, it's also our budget season. Uh, this year, our office asked for ideas from constituents for projects our community wants to be funded. District 4 <laughs> constituents can propose a capital project requires a minimum budget of $50,000 for something a city agency can build or improve in our district that will last for an extended period of time. Once a constituent proposes a project idea, our staff will check in with the city agencies to see whether or not it is feasible to fund. If so, Councilmember Powers will designate funding to the agency for that capital project. If not, our staff will happily look to work and figure out ways to solve that project, um, that problem at hand. I hope you will consider submitting ideas to improve our community parks, schools, libraries, and more. I will drop the links for, for that in the chat. And that is all for me. Okay, thank you very much, Franklin. Matt Tig. Hi everyone, I'm Matt Tai from Assemblymember Godfrey's office. I'm going to start with some legislation that we have going on. Um, right now, New York State is facing a shortage of home care workers as more and more people are entering the ages where home care becomes more necessary. Assemblymember Godfrey's bill, the Fair Pay for Home Care Act, addresses the staffing shortage by increasing wages for home care workers, many of whom are only paid $15 an hour. Additionally, another bill, the New York Home Care First Act, reprioritizes home care as a primary option for patients and aligns the state's policies, rates, and procedures with this principle so that home care can really be a first option before going into a more institutional setting. Um, budget season's well underway up in Albany. As chair of the Health Committee, Assemblymember Gottfried, we work to defend and expand health care funding for our state's Medicaid program, as well as health care providers. Uh, the governor announced a budget proposal a few weeks ago, which can be found online, and the assembly will soon be, released, be releasing their own proposal. You may have heard that the governor's proposal includes eliminating the statewide limit on the maximum density of residential development. The proposal will remove the long-standing reasonable and necessary cap on residential development in New York State that limits it to a floor area ratio of 12. This would allow grossly oversized development and remove reasonable long-standing regulations on development in many communities, including already very densely populated parts of New York City. Assemblymember Gottfried strongly opposes this proposal in the budget and moving forward. And I'll wrap it up there. Okay, thank you, Matt. Next will be Lingwing Chen. Hi, thank you, Vicky. Good evening, everyone. This is Lin Jin Chen from Manhattan DA's office. Just want to quickly mention that our office has launched our high school internship program. It is open to all high school students who either live or attend school in Manhattan. The deadline is March 4th. I will, I will share the link to the chat. And we, uh, and meanwhile, we also have our gun violence prevention fellowship, which is open to college and high school students and the teen dating violence presentation. Um, I will share all this information in the chat as well as my contact info. Thank you, I'll wrap it here. Okay, thank you very much. Next up will be Lori. Good evening, hi. Um, well, tomorrow we are also doing a free self-test kit and N95 mask giveaway at uh, noon with Ryan Health at the NYCHA Fulton Houses. That's at 419 West 17th Street. Um, Councilman Botcher has been very busy. On February 12th, he held a press conference to call on the city to move forward with street safety redesigns in Chelsea, Hell's Kitchen, and Lower Sixth Avenue in Greenwich Village. He's advocating for more protected bike lanes, pedestrian islands with street trees, and asking the city to move forward expeditiously with those plans. In light of the recent tragedy in the subway regarding Michelle Go, Eric, uh, along with other electives, joined a vigil in Times Square. One of the most important reasons Eric ran for the city council is to address these mental health issues and um, has released a plan to do so. In January, he wrote an op-ed called Toward a More Mentally Healthy New York City, and I can put that uh, link in the chat. 
And finally, regarding sanitation issues, another priority for the councilman, Eric joined Congressman Nadler, Manhattan Borough President Levine, Assembly Members Glick, Rosenthal, and Gottfried, and Senator Hoylman in a letter to Mayor Adams and Sanitation Commissioner Grayson with three immediate asks, restore corner basket service to pre-pandemic levels, restore street sweeping to two times a week, and restore curbside composting service in Council District 3. And I could put a link to the letter in the chat. And that's it for us. Great, thank you, Lori. Next up will be Alexis Richards. Great, thank you, Vicki. Um, hi, everyone, Alexis here. So since we last spoke, uh, Carlina was named or appointed chair of the New York City Council Committee on Criminal Justice. Just yesterday, Carlina toured Rikers Island with the DOC Commissioner Molina. Um, and today in city council, she introduced her first bill of the new term, which would mandate that the Department of Correction address interruptions to medical care and medical appointments in the event of a lock-in and immediately afterward. Also in the past month, the councilwoman has distributed more than 200 at-home COVID tests throughout the district. We have more distribution events coming up. So please, of course, stay tuned to our newsletter and social media for locations and times to pick up tests. We also have been visiting all of the schools in the district. The councilwoman has been meeting with principals, faculty and staff to determine schools most pressing needs as we head into this next um, year of the pandemic. She also distributed KN95 masks and child size masks to all schools that she's visited. Um, and finally, the council members groundbreaking package of legislation securing rights and protections for delivery workers went into effect just a few short weeks ago. She celebrated in Times Square with Senator Schumer and Congresswoman um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, as well as several other supporters from the Workers' Justice Project. Um, and thank you so much and have a great rest of the month to everyone. Thank you, Alexis. Okay, next up will be Justin Shea. Hello everyone, how are you doing? Uh, I'm quite pleased with myself today because I just figured out how to use the Zoom raise hand function um, <laughs> three years into the pandemic. Um, but yeah, since the, the last time we spoke, a lot's happened, it's budget season. Um, and recently at a budget hearing, Brad was able to get the New York State Medicaid director to commit to apply for a 115 uh, Medicaid waiver, which would allow the state to fund long-term stays uh, in large mental health institutions. Additionally, the Transportation Committee recently reported on Brad's bill, uh, Sammy's Law, which allows New York City to lower speed limits to 20 miles per hour in all areas and to five mile per hour on certain streets. Um, additionally, Brad introduced a bill that would uh, help uh, prevent PFAS chemicals from being used in sprays and wipes that are meant to prevent condensation on eyeglasses. Um, a lot of those sprays currently have high levels of uh, PFAS chemicals within them, uh, which are linked to problems such as kidney cancer, thyroid disease, and birth defects. Um, additionally, in late January, the Senate passed a bill to allow all public bodies to continue video conferencing options for meetings uh, for the duration of the state of emergency. Um, and finally, uh, uh, a lot of the elected officials here have been giving out free at home COVID tests, Brad as well. So just be on the lookout for that in our newsletter. And additionally, President Biden uh, has announced that all Americans are now eligible for four at-home COVID tests uh, free at no cost delivered through the Postal Service. So I'll share the link uh, in the chat there um, if you're not able to, to get one from one of us on, one of us on this, uh, this Zoom. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Justin. I think last up will be Betsy Schmidt. Good evening. Um, so today, Congresswoman Maloney held a press conference to go along with her introduction of the Preventing Pretrial Gun Purchases Act. Um, this act would amend federal gun laws to help ensure that the National Instant Criminal Background Check System denies gun sales to any person subject to a pretrial release order from a court uh, that prohibits the person from purchasing, possessing, or receiving guns. The act follows a legislative package of five gun safety reform bills that Rep. Maloney introduced last year. Um, on Tuesday, the House uh, passed the Bipartisan Postal Service Reform Act, which Congresswoman Maloney sponsored. Uh, the Postal Service's financial condition has been deteriorating over the past decade, so this act is critical to helping the Postal Service remain financially viable while continuing to provide high-quality service. These provisions include increasing the transparency of delivery services, requiring that the Postal Service deliver mail six days a week, and repealing the requirement for the Postal Service to pre-fund retiree health benefits 
a current requirement no other federal government entity it has to comply with. Um, Congresswoman Maloney is now calling on Majority Leader Schumer to bring this critical reform bill to the Senate floor um, as soon as possible. Um, Congresswoman Maloney is excited to share that last week she co-sponsored and voted for the America Competes Act, which would includes bold investment in research, innovation, and American manufacturing. This legislation will strengthen our supply chain, accelerate production, and turbocharge our capacity to create the technologies of the future. It also includes uh, the Congresswoman's Women and Minorities in STEM Booster Act, um, which she originally introduced last year. Um, finally, I will also say we have joined the party. We have been giving out, I think we've given out as right now about like 900 COVID tests um, across our district in masks. And we have our last event tomorrow at the 92nd Street Y. Um, if you wanna pick, come up and pick a test up from us. Um, or as Justin said, you can get them online. Um, I'll put my information in the chat if you need to contact us. Have a good day. <laughs> Thank you, Betsy. And we do have Brian with us, Brian Lafferty from the Borough President's Office. Hi, Brian. Hi, Vicki. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's good to be with you this evening. Uh, I just have a few items to report. Uh, first, the CB application portal uh, is now live and applications are due on March 1st. Uh, I'll put the link in the chat. Um, I also uh, wanted to report that um, the borough president is pleased to see subway ridership uh, increase to 3 million trips on Tuesday for the first time since uh, the Omicron uh, variant hit in December. Um, the borough president believes we can uh, further facilitate the recovery by improving the safety and reliability of our subways. Uh, so on uh, January 21st, all 10 members of the Manhattan delegation of the city council and the borough president wrote to uh, MTA chair Lieber to immediately begin a pilot of platform barriers, at subway stations that have been experiencing high levels of platform related incidents. Uh, <clears throat> I also wanted to uh, report that on February 3rd, the borough president uh, joined state Senator Hoylman, state Senator Jackson, Congressman Nadler, Assemblymember Gottfried, Councilmember Botcher, in writing to Amtrak CEO William Flynn and MTA Chair and CEO General Lieber, calling on them to add additional seating in Moynihan's uh, main train hall. Uh, this is an issue of equity, uh, as seating in public spaces and transit facilities improves their accessibility to all who live and visit in Manhattan. Uh, and that's all I have to report. Okay, thank you, Brian. In the chat. Thank you. I think we can now go to the public. Those who wish to speak that are members of the public, please raise your hand to be called upon. Lisa Wager. Ah, there we go. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Hi, my name is Lisa Wager. I'm the Director of Government and Community Relations at the Fashion Institute of Technology. Um, I just have a quick update for us uh, on our status. The spring semester classes were delayed one week and we started on Monday the 31st on campus. We're continuing the same vaccination and masking requirements from the fall semester. Mm -hmm. And every single person who returned to campus and to the residence halls had to show a negative COVID test uh, that had been taken no less than uh, no more than 72 hours earlier. Uh, there's a new exhibition at the museum at FIT, Reinvention and Restlessness, Fashion in the 90s, which opened uh, in the middle of January and features more than 75 looks from Alexander McQueen, Hussein Chalaya and Gucci Calvin, who's an alum, Helmut Lang, Maison Martin Margiela, Prada, Julie Bette, and many others. Um, the exhibition documents a decade that not only marked the end of a century, but also the end of a millennium, and it explores the fast paced and sometimes incongruous nature of fashion trends. And it looks at eight important trends that helped to define the decade, focusing on themes that stimulated excitement and change. Um, as you know, the museum is the only museum devoted to fashion in New York City. It's free and open to the public Wednesday through Sunday with proof of vaccination and face masks required. I hope you'll visit the exhibitions up till uh, the middle of April. Uh, the Center for Continuing and Professional Studies courses are starting soon. In fashion, we have fashion illustration and introduction to fashion styling. 
In business, there's creative business plans for consulting success and build your business on Instagram. Sustainability, there's an introduction to sustainability, sustainable marketing and clothing reconstruction. And we also have uh, computer skills for creatives, Illustrator 1, Illustrator 2, Fashion Design, Photoshop, and Rhino 1. And uh, some of these are certificate courses, which you can um, take and get a certificate. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Next will be Ellen Mackler. Thank you, Vicki. Um, good evening. I am Lola Finkelstein's daughter, and I'm reading a statement on her behalf. Here it goes. Lola speaking. I served for 30 years on this board, three as chair. I am here this evening because I am very concerned about the open restaurants bill before the city council. This bill is so consequential. It will change New York as we know it. No matter how much we care about our favorite restaurants, there can be no denying the negative impacts of this legislation, sanitation, the rats and the trash, safety, room for fire trucks and ambulances, accessibility for wheelchairs, walkers, baby carriages, quality of life, noise, music, strangers eating under our windows, preservation, appropriateness in our treasured historic districts, Good design, this is New York, these sheds are in our treasured public realm. When will we have our opportunity as a board to weigh in? This legislation must be sent to the 59 community boards before it's voted at the city council because one size does not fit all. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen, and hello to Lola, one of our great chairs. Uh, let's see, anyone else signing up to Raise your hand, anyone else to speak? Just to note, if you're joining us by phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand if you're joining us by phone. I don't see anyone. Okay. All right, we will now enter the business session of the board where, as I mentioned earlier, only board members are allowed to speak. The um, please board members remember to have your videos on during the meeting. So um, right now I would like a motion to accept the minutes, the January minutes. May I have a motion? So moved. And a second. Second. And a vote. Good evening. Uh, Akalis. Yes. Behar. Yes. Eichmann. Yes. Rosnahan. Yes. Castro. Yes. True. Yes. Diggins. Yes. Dosen. Yes. Ford. Yes. Brewer. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Gashow. Yes. Haas. Yes. Harris. Yes. Hirschberg. Yes. Heyer. Heyer. Come back to you. Um, Isaacs. Yes. Kayback. Yes. Kong. Yes. Kalafarski. Yes. Kinsella. Yes. Avingia. Yes. Magasico. Yes. Livese. Yes. Lusik. Yes. McCall. Yes. Miller. Miller. Oh, you'll keep that on. Okay. Shapiro. Yes. Sigmund. Yes. What's going to be? Yes. Smith. Yes. Thunderland. Yes. Spandorf is not here. Sorry. Uh, Stern. Yes. Uh, Sung. Yes. Webb. Yes. Whalen. Yes. Yang. Yes. Uh, higher. He was on before. 
is on. Okay. Motion passes. Okay, thank you all. Uh, as my report tonight, I'd like to go over the unusual way in which we'll be dealing with our first item. So as you know, with the ability to conduct virtual meetings due to the pandemic, we instituted a task force to help guide us in determining how we would like to see future meetings conducted and what that would entail regarding the open meetings law. So the Manhattan community boards are all in the process and some have already addressed the issue by way of recommendations and uh, or support regarding changes to the open meetings law. This is because the law as it currently is written prohibits the use of remote or hybrid meetings and has only been allowed as you know in emergency situations. The task force, Tristan Haas, Barbara Spandorf, Will Hire and Joseph Frewer began by collecting data from board members, basically to gauge the board's preferences and comments of in-person, virtual, and hybrid meetings. Tristan will go over the results with you prior to questions and comments and voting on the resolution tonight, which puts forth our opinion regarding all three scenarios. So as you know, in order to conduct future virtual and or hybrids, the open meetings law must be amended, which is why we're doing this tonight. The resolution was developed by the task force and members of the executive committee, but it did not go through a regular committee with a vote. And for that reason, we'll be acting as a committee of the whole, which means that we, the full board, we are acting as a committee and conducting this portion of our meeting tonight in the same way all other committees of the board operate. So in order to do that, I will need a motion to move us into a committee of the whole. We will start with an introduction, information regarding the survey, and then proceed with questions and comments from the membership, and then questions and comments from the public. As is our procedure, we then enter the business session of the committee with finalization of the reso before us and our vote. So at this point, I would like a motion for the board to go into committee of the whole. A moved. And a second. 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 Okay. So now we're a committee of the whole. And, the, and I'll give a, a brief in, introduction and then Tristan will come in. The resolution before supports expanding the open meetings law to ensure maximum transparency, efficiency, and best use of resources for public deliberations and decisions. It also states that we should have the ability to hold virtual and hybrid meetings under certain circumstances. Further, we've resolved which states that, quote, any law passed should recognize that attending meetings through virtual means shall be legally equivalent to attending in person for quorum and voting purposes and acceptable under the open meetings law, end quote. Finally, we have a statement in the last resolve which supports allowing all New York City's community boards the ability to hold virtual and or hybrid meetings. So we have not dealt with the particulars of how meetings will operate, such as, and a lot of people have these questions, how many and under what circumstances should hybrids versus in-person versus fully remote meetings be held? Or should there be a requirement on the number of in-person meetings members attend versus remote? Uh, it seems as though community boards will be dealing with those particulars individually, but collaboratively, should the law be amended. Okay, Tristan, will you start by going over the results of the surveys that were filled out? Sure, thank you, Vicki. Um, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Um, so start, to start us off, thank you all for your participating participation in the survey. Uh, we got results from 41 of you, so 82%, which is pretty good. 
Uh, to start off, we asked about your views on how board members have been engaged in committee meetings and in the full board. Um, so at the committee level, 33% thought it was improved, 39% thought it stayed the same, and 28% thought um, it got worse. And engagement meaning um, attending or a continued attendance of policy or um, being active and looking at every application and exposing it to thorough review. Uh, in the full board, um, it was essentially the same um, with the no change category growing um, an extra 11%, uh, but the same 33% thought that engagement improved. Uh, next, we ask about your views on how um, the engagement of the public has been impacted by these meetings occurring over Zoom and more than 60% thought that it has improved. 20% um, no change, 11% thought it got worse. Um, and then a couple of people submitted some um, other feedback. Uh, then we asked about your meeting preferences on how you, if it was up to you, how you would like meetings to be conducted at the committee and the full board level. Um, so at the committee level, 5% um, thought it should be conducted fully in person, 12% thought it should be conducted in person for board members, but offering an opportunity for the public to attend in person or hybrid. Uh, and then 59% thought it should be hybrid for all uh, the public and for board members, and 24% thought it should be fully remote. Uh, and for the full board, uh, it's by and large the same. Um, the hybrid preferences grew by 9% um, and the fully remote shrunk by a few percentage points. So next we asked about whether or not you thought if we were to advocate for changes to the state open meetings law, those changes should be extend to government and public officials and meetings as well. Um, and so we ask that because as it's currently written, the Open Meetings Law doesn't delineate between volunteer organizations like community boards um, and public administrations or um, government official meetings. It's just one set of rules that apply um, to all meetings under its scope. Um, and so 67% thought that whatever we advocate for should apply to those meetings and those officials as well. 25% thought that in-person requirements should apply, and an 8% thought uh, provided other feedback. Um, I would note that when it came to this question, um, it, it seemed like there was some confusion by some respondents based on the qualitative feedback about whether we were talking about um, giving public officials attending community boards the option to participate remotely uh, versus what the intention was like we're talking about like the public official and government meetings. Um, so I would take this specific response um, and the results with, with a grain of salt um, and apologies for any confusion you might have had with this one. Uh, then we asked if we enacted a hybrid model where for every meeting members of the board could attend in person or virtually how would you attend most of the time? Um, so 25% said in person, 34% apologies for the uh, percent said they would attend virtually, 24% uh, said they would attend basically 50-50 and 17% provided other feedback. So usually like specific percentages like 80-20 or stuff like that. Uh, then we asked about um, if we were to enact a, a hybrid model, what requirements limitations should apply. 30% um, said limit the number of times members can participate remotely. 60% said require cameras to be on. Uh, one person said they shouldn't count remote participation towards quorum, but permit their participation. And then 40% of you said there should be no limitations or requirements. Uh, then we asked about in-person precautions. Um, and so under the Current open meetings law, there's no mechanism in place to have any type of restriction based on COVID vaccination or COVID test or to meet in facilities that have their own requirements. Um, and so we asked whether you would attend an in-person meeting if you were unable to know the vax or test status of other attendees. 34% said yes, 
50% said no, 17% said other feedback, usually something along the lines of um, it depends on how the pandemic is progressing at that moment. Uh, and then finally, we asked about what, what precautions you'd want to meet, um, as of what precautions you'd want in place if we resumed in-person meetings. 10% said none, 60% said social distancing requirements, 73% said mandatory masks, 31% said negative COVID tests if permitted by law, and 78% said vaccination requirements. Um, so those are the full results. I can send across uh, the full deck so you guys have it for your records, um, but that's all from my end. And back to you, Vicki. Okay, thank you so much, Tristan. Uh, before we get into discussion, just make sure if anyone has a conflict of any sort to let us know um, and also mention it before you speak. And we will start off with whether or not there are any questions from the membership. Raise your hand, please. Samir. So I think on one of the slides, it might have been one of the earlier ones, there was a question about particip or engagement of the public. And I think um some people said that engagement went down i'm just curious um if we looked at like the numbers of people who participated as a whole so like let's say there were 20 percent more people and of everyone five percent were less engaged we still have a lot more engaged people i'm just curious if we've looked at numbers for like participation of the public tristan uh, no, we I we did not look at like Zoom records to see the number of participants. Okay. Any other questions? All right, let's go to questions from the public. Does anyone in the public have a question? If you do, please raise your hand. Uh, looks like someone uh, via phone. I don't know who it is. Uh, ending in 665. If you, if you hit star six, you'll be able to unmute yourself on the phone. Star six to unmute if you're on the phone. It's Chuck Miller. I have no comments. I'm uh, listening in on a train. Oh. Sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry. Did that? Did he say it was Chuck? Is that who yes. that? Oh, okay. Yeah, he's calling in. All right, and he's not able to to speak, or he is. He didn't have a comment. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't see other. Any, I don't see any other hands raised from the public. Does anyone have any comments from the public? If not, we can go right into our business session of the committee. That's the same six six five. So I guess that's Chuck with the hand is still up, but it right. Okay. I do not see anyone. So back to our committee. Uh, comments from the members. Todd. Hi everybody. So as you all know, I'm actually in the meeting in the business of meetings, I run a technology conference center. So I totally support this effort. And I think that revising the law is of critical importance if we wanna build over time our community engagement, as well as make it easy to maintain our candidates for community board members. The only thing I would add is as we go down this path, it's absolutely critical that we as a community board and whoever in the government is going to be considering this fund it and make sure they have technical expertise that will advise the community boards on how to get this done properly. So 
in other words, I know from my own experience that you can do hybrid meetings and have an excellent result with terrific quality if it's done right. If it isn't done right, then I think what you're going to find is that the general public will sour on it and give it a bad name. So we have a lot of community boards, a lot of different government entities. We know that uh, the history of the government to roll things like this out in a consistent and effective way often doesn't happen. So let's, there, you know, there's the utility and practical aspect of it, which I think based on the results of the survey, I think there's a, a consensus to, to do it. It's been prompted by the pandemic, but let's not forget we have to budget for this and we have to make sure that there's an effort at the right level made to make sure that it's done properly. Thank you, Todd. EJ? Yeah, I would just say that um, I think this, uh, I think the resolution is very well uh, constructed, which is to say that, you know, we don't know yet exactly what um, the, the perfect hybrid meeting looks like. <laughs> Um, but, uh, you know, what this resolution calls for as it's written is, is that, um, you know, at least as applies to us, community boards get the flexibility to decide and determine that for themselves, um, to determine, you know, in the past, uh, when we had to have in-person meetings, we had to make sure that they were open during the pandemic, as we have had almost all entirely virtual meetings, we have had to make sure that they are open and anyone who wants can attend. A hybrid meeting would have to, you know, similarly allow anyone who wants to attend to attend. We don't know which of those three, where on that spectrum we will end up, but as long as we're required to make them open, I think maximizing flexibility for community boards going forward is the, um, is the right move. Uh, community boards should be able to be flexible as long as they are ensuring openness of whatever meeting they're holding. And that's uh, what the text of the resolution calls for. So I think it's, I think it's well written. Great. Thanks, CJ, for explanation, you know, explaining your support. That's great. Anyone else have any comments? Nancy? I just wanted to say that um, through this process and this venue, um, we have heard from more uh, various groups. For example, we've had several um, times in our committee, um, uh, people coming who have disabilities who would not otherwise be able to be heard by our committees. And I think that's very important. Um, we are engaging more diverse groups than we have had in the past. I would say that also for our senior citizens and our elderly. So. Um, and also um, people with children who may not be able to get a, a babysitter so that they can come to a community board meeting. We need these voices. And with this um, venue, with this process, with doing it this way, we just have a lot more people and a lot more diverse groups. Um, we can hear their voices. And I think it's important for us as a community board for them to be heard. Great. Thanks, Nancy. Anyone else? Clayton. Sorry, this is somewhat redundant, but I just wanted to echo the prior two comments and also just add that as it, in committee, well, in full board too, I think we've all seen, this is anecdotally, data would be great for it. Like um, Samir was saying about actual numbers of this, but I think we've all seen how many more members of the public have been involved. And just to Nancy's point about accessibility, we have had members of the public with various disabilities specifically acknowledge that they are there because they are able to. And that just has blown my mind on more than one occasion. And that's not the only population that has said that. We have had people who have said, I'm grateful because I've never been able to come before for so many different reasons. And so I think we all are aware of this, but I just kind of also wanted to lend my voice to, we, that we just should not overstate the importance. The whole point of what we do is public engagement. It's the whole point. So it just seems so critical, especially now when you know, we don't know what's going to happen and we've got to remain flexible and all we're asking for is the ability to do that. So I just, I'm very excited and enthusiastic and supportive of the way this work was handled and I applaud everybody who worked on it. Thank you, Clayton. Okay, anyone else? I think we can then go to a vote.
Craig. Uh, sorry, let's go. Michaelis. Yes. Behar. Behar. Be back. Sorry. Let's go on. So we'll come back. Uh, Beichman. Yes. Rosnahan. Yes. Castro. Yes. Uh, Chu. Yes. Diggins. Yes. Joseph. Yes. Ford. Yes. Frewer. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Gashow. Yes. Haas. Yes. Harris. Yes. Hirschberg. Yes. Heyer. Yes. Isaacs. Yes. Kayback. Yes. Kahn. Yes. Olafarski. Yes. Stella. Yes. Lavingia. Yes. Lagasico. Yes. Uh, Libese. Yes. Lusik. Yes. McCall. Yes. Miller. Yes. Shapiro. Yes. Sigmund. Yes. So that's going to be yes. Smith. Yes. Sunderland. Yes. Stern. Yes. Sung. Yes. Webb. Yes. Whalen. Yes. Yang. Yes. Uh, Behar. Okay, uh, motion passes. Okay, thank you. Uh, and a big thank you to this task force, Tristan Haas, Barbara Spandorf, Will Heyer and Joseph Frewer, and particularly to Tristan for putting together the visuals and compiling the information that was given tonight. Thanks again. So that concludes us being a committee of the whole, which means that I will adjourn that portion of the larger regular committee, uh, regular board meeting. And now we will go back into our monthly meeting and we will start with our committee reports, starting with T and A, e, EJ. Thanks, Vicki. Uh, t &E had three resolutions um, this month. I'd like to have them deemed red and okay. bundled. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, the the applications this month were, were two bus stop applications and one hotel loading zone application. The first uh, is a bus stop application by ABM Industry Groups, LLC for a um, bus stop on the Northeast corner of West 31st Street and 8th Avenue. Um, as, as we always do, the um, members of the Transportation Environment Committee um, uh, spoke with the applicant and visited the site. Um, this is a, uh, this will be a stop for a um, bus that uh, exclusively travels within New York City. Um, the location, is actually already a stop um, for a separate company. Um, as assessed by DOT, uh, the current bus stop, the, the current length of the bus stop um, has enough space to allow the addition of another bus company at that location. Uh, the, the new company, ABM, will um, conduct 13 daily pickups Monday to Sunday um, between 7 a.m. and 10 a.m. in the morning and 12 daily drop-offs uh, Monday to Sunday between 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. in the afternoon. Um, as mentioned, uh, the t &E committee um, visited the site, uh, spoke to the applicant. Um, because it's an existing uh, bus stop already um, for another company, uh, this was not, um, uh, there was not much concern about whether or not it was a good location for a stop. And, um, uh, finally, uh, the neighbors and the community uh, generally had no objection to additional use at this location. So um, that application uh, uh, to approve uh, that application to approve the location passed unanimously with a vote of fourteen to zero. Okay, thank you, EJ. Anyone have any conflict with this application? Any questions to the resolution? 
Any comments? Okay, are you bundling? Did you say bundle? Yes, please. Okay, so we go on to the next. Thanks. The next application is another bus stop application by Go New York Tours Incorporated doing business as Top View. This is a um, uh, tour bus company. So once again, these are uh, these buses stay exclusively within the city. Um, the uh, proposed location is a bus stop at 766 8th Avenue, which is at West 47th Street. Um, the applicant proposes uh, pickups and drop-offs in front of 766 8th Avenue, Monday through Sunday, uh, between 8.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. Uh, with a pickup every 30 minutes. This uh, was actually a pre-existing bus stop for another um, bus company, Gray Line New York Tours, um, but that uh, service for that company was suspended during the pandemic. So for the most part, this was a pre-existing bus stop and this would be a reversion to pre-pandemic um, conditions at this location. Once again, um, uh, we spoke to the applicant, we visited the site um, and uh, because it was a pre-existing uh, site, again, we were not too concerned that we were dealing with um, new conditions that we had never seen before. Uh, once again, neighbors and the community generally uh, had no objection to um, uh, going back to the original uh, bus stop use at this location. And uh, so we approved this application with a vote of 14 to zero. Okay, thank you. Any conflicts with this application? Questions to the resolution? Sarah. I, uh, I was a little confused because it said that um, Gray Line uh, has been suspended due to the pandemic. Well, when the pandemic is over, is Gray Line coming back? And is that going to be an overcrowding at that bus stop? Or am I not understanding this right? Um, I, my, under, my understanding is that they're not coming back, that, that suspended in this particular situation uh, means that that, that company uh, ceased uh, conducting those operations um, during the, uh, 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 when the pandemic um, uh, began and, and, and that they're not returning. So this is, a, this is a vacant bus stop at this point and from this point going forward. Okay, thank you. Fortunato. Uh, yeah, I just want to add on to Sarah. I actually had the same question in committee and the DOT representative who was there uh, let me know that if Gray Lines were to start up again, that they would negotiate that with the DOT. I remember asking that in committee. Just more complex for that. Thank you, Fortunato. And, and presumably, gray line would have to come back to us again at that point and and we would get to weigh in on whether or not two buses at the same location was appropriate or not right anyone else any comments okay that takes us to the third resolution 50 west 36th street yeah, this is a request for a hotel loading zone um, in front of 50 West 36th Street. Um, for a little bit of context here, DOT regularly um, uh, uh, creates and allows uh, hotel loading zones in front of hotels that are larger than 100 rooms. Whenever a hotel does not have 100 rooms, DOT does not automatically grant that um, hotel loading zone, but rather requires them to come to the community board um, to, uh, to find out if, if we think that a hotel loading zone is appropriate in that particular situation. In this particular case, this hotel does not have 100 rooms, it has 94 rooms. So it has almost 100 rooms. Um, but you know, as, as a matter of course, um, DOT automatically does not grant that and comes to us to, uh, to ask our opinion. Um, in this particular case, uh, the applicant requested uh, a loading zone about 35 feet in length. Um, it, this is a location where there are other hotels in the area. There's a, there's a loading zone 
um, adjacent to one side, there's another loading zone about 20 feet down, uh, down the block on the other side. Um, in this particular case, and though DOT will not automatically grant it, DOT will weigh in on the location. And in this particular case, DOT advised the community board that a loading zone would be beneficial in this location, that it would result in, in better flow of traffic, less obstruction, and, and without, a lo without a loading zone here, um, we'd very, the hotel would very likely be causing a double parking location, a uh, double parking situation in a lot of cases. So DOT advised that a hotel loading zone is, was uh, advised here, but, um, but ultimately uh, deferred, to, um, uh, uh, deferred to us to weigh in. Once again, um, uh, members of the community board examined this, um, largely agreed. Uh, it's a hotel that comes close to the 100 room standard. So it's, it, it's largely of um, the appropriate size for a loading zone. And, um, and we have granted uh, two similar applications to this over the past, um, you know, so many years. Uh, so there is precedent for us to, um, to approve this, particularly because DOT believes it would be um, a better traffic experience as opposed to a worse traffic experience. Um, as, as always, we, we point out that um, even though we're approving this and even though we've done it two times in the past, uh, this type of approval should not be, um, you know, uh, should not create a precedent that, is, that just assumes we're going to green light every type of this application that comes in. Um, we, we certainly continue to look at all of these on a case by case basis to determine whether or not it's appropriate in that particular site. In this case, we did feel that it was and um, the committee voted to approve specifically um, uh, hotel uh, loading zone markings in this uh, location as opposed to, you know, just a no standing location. Um, we we uh, set that condition, but we voted to approve it with a vote of 13 to zero. Okay, thank you. All right, anyone uh, has a conflict with any of these, please raise your hand. And does anyone have a question to this resolution. Mike. Yeah, I just wanted to mention, I looked up a gray line. I used to work for them as a tour guide years ago. And I see that they are doing business now as Top View. And that location on 8th Avenue used to be like the home base for gray line. And I'll bet anything that it's now one of the stops for Top View. So. Maybe there's some kind of confusion with Gray Line and Top View, but apparently they're doing business as Top View now. And uh, I, I don't see it as a problem, but just to get things straight, Top View, Gray Line, apparently the same company. Okay, thank you. We've already, we have left that application. Or do you have any questions on the uh, hotel loading? No? Okay. Does anyone have any questions? On, does anyone have any comments on the last resolution, 50 West 36? Okay, then we can take all three to a vote. Craig? Um, let's start from the bottom. Uh, Yang? Yes. Whalen? Yes. Webb? Yes. Sung? Yes. Stern? Yes. Sonderland? Yes. Uh, Smith. Yes. Slutskin, yes. Sigmund. Yes. Shapiro. Yes. Miller. Yes. McCall. Yes. Lusick. Yes. Livese. Yes. Lagasico. Yes. Avingia. Yes. Kinsella. Yes. Kalafarski. Yes. Hong. Yes. Kayback. Yes. Isaacs. Yes. Higher. Yes. Hirschberg. Yes. Harris. Uh, Harris, not here. Haas. Yes. Gushow. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Brewer. Yes. Ford. Yes. Josen. Yes. Diggins. Yes. Chu. Yes. Castro. Yes. Brosnahan. 
Yes. Beichman. Yes. Behar. Michaelis. Yes. Motion passed. Motion passed. Uh, Craig, Craig, you skipped me, John. Oh, Harris. Did you just join? Okay. Harris. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Craig. That moves us on to public safety quality of life. Craig. Oh, yeah, sorry. Again. John, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I don't want to do that. Okay. So uh, this application, uh, sorry, I'd like to have my uh, resolution deemed read. Definitely. <laughs> okay. Uh, this application is for 433 Park Avenue South uh, between 29th and 30th Streets. Uh, it's for a uh, new restaurant slash bar slash pub um, slash lounge. Uh, premises are about 1,600 square feet, uh, one entrance, one exit, uh, 17 tables, 50 seats, uh, 15 bar stools, uh, one patron bar, 74 capacity. Uh, the issues that uh, we discussed at detail is relating to uh, sound and to some extent also hours. Uh, we had a very long uh, and detailed discussion on that and where we came out were on hours. Uh, 12 midnight close on Sundays, 1 a.m. on uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, uh, 1.30 a.m. Thursdays through Saturdays. Uh, on music, uh, there were concerns from the residents a lot. They, there had been issues with the previous uh, operator at this location. Uh, and where we came out was that they would, uh, the oper this applicant will be allowed to have ambient music, uh, but there will be no live music. Uh, they may come back to us at some point down the line, which is, uh, they're right, they can always come back to us. Um, but they, uh, at this point, will only have background level music. Uh, they will also get a um, sound engineer, or they've already engaged a sound engineer, and they will put in sound buffering um, in the meantime. Um, the, also, the applicant also agreed to our standard stipulations, no outside promoters, uh, no velvet rope queuing, uh, no sidewalk cafe unless they come back to us, uh, no bottomless brunch or bottle service. Uh, they'll maintain the cleanliness of the, the, cleanliness of the sidewalk. Um, and the standard transfer for transfer provisions and uh, hotline as well. Uh, this was um, approved by the committee 11000. And just uh, just to be clear, this is a deny unless they per they adhere to all the stipulations. And the stipulations is on start on page uh, their affidavit starts on page 11 of your packet. So it's not an approval; it's a denial unless they adhere to the stipulations. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Craig. Does anyone have a conflict with this application? Does anyone have questions to the resolution? Are there any com? Oops, Sarah, did you have your hand up? Uh, yes, yes, thank you. Uh, having been a proofreader and a typographer, on page uh, three of the affidavit, um, if you look at uh, the wording here, uh, net, N-E-T, they mean not, N-O-T, not use the basement, not apply, if they say net, N-E-T, then net serve a bottomless brunch and net offer bottle service. There are some other typographical uh, glitches, but this, I don't know whether this would cause a problem or not, but I thought I'd just bring it up. <laughs> it's actually, it, sorry, Sarah, that actually is not. But if you look at, if you look closely, it's it's the printer. It's actually oh. a, a weird printer. So okay, it does, <laughs> Thank it you. does say not. It's it, if you look at it, it's kind of the font looks different because it's printed weirdly. But it's okay. Thank you. And, and and in addition, just so you are aware, in our in our resolution, which goes to the SLA. It, it, it reiterates the knots, and that's usually what, what the SLA takes a look at as well. All right, thank you. But thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, thank you. Always good to have an eagle eye. Todd? I just want to commend the applicant and the residents of the building and the people in the neighborhood in the 29th Street Block Association these were long and at some times difficult negotiations and they were able to keep their tools and focus on working cooperatively. I urge them uh, as 
the restaurant and establishment uh, opens to continue to work together. Uh, we as a community board are here to offer our good, uh, you know, offer our advice and help if there are any issues. And I'm glad to see, hopefully, that this will pass. Thank you. And thanks for your work on this, Todd. I know it wasn't an easy one, that's for sure. Um, all right, anybody else have any comments? Okay, we can now take this to a vote. Uh, Akalis. Yes. Uh, Eichmann. Yes. Rosnahan. Yes. Castro. Yes. Chu. Yes. Diggins. Yes. Dosen. Yes. Ford. Yes. Brewer. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Joshow. Yes. Haas. Yes. Harris. Yes. Hirschberg. Yes. Heyer. Yes. Isaacs. Yes. Kayback. Yes. Kong. Yes. Kalafarsky. Yes. Kinsella. Yes. Lavingia. Yes. Logosico. Yes. Libise. Yes. Lusick. Yes. McCall. Yes. Miller. Yes. Hero. Yes. Sigmund. Yes. Sigmund. Uh, sorry, Slutskin, yes. Smith. Yes. Sunderland. Yes. Stern. Yes. Sung. Yes. Webb. Yes. Whalen. Yes. Yang. Yes. Uh, passes. Okay, thank you everyone. That concludes uh, the business before okay. us this evening. If there's no new business or old business, this meeting is adjourned. And I thank you all. See you next month. Thank Good you. evening, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.